You know, and congratulations to all those students who are graduating. In the next couple of weeks, we'll recognize them. Our student ministry and Pastor Brooklyn and the team do such a great job. We want you to know that you are appreciated, and it's an amazing accomplishment, whether it's high school or kindergarten or college or your further degree, we, uh, we are proud of you. I want you to know. You know, I, lo- I love those words. It's time for letting go. I'm not in control. Jesus, you are. Jesus, you are. You know, it's easy to sing when we're all together. It's sometimes hard to live when we're out there in the world going day by day through the challenges and struggles and temptations and problems. Last week, we talked about that. And we're going to go a little bit further in the book of James as we just dig into this very practical and powerful book of the Bible. You know, we don't believe every book's inspired in the Bible. We believe every word is inspired in the Bible. And that means that God put it there and spoke it for a very specific reason, both to the audience and to those of us today who call ourselves Christians who've been named by the blood of Christ. I want to say hello to everyone watching online. Uh, just to let you know kind of what's coming up, we, uh, we are trying to let more people know what we are about as far as the center of hope and especially Forge Christian High School. We still have a ways to go to reach our goal of 300 students for the first school year. Uh, we have already surpassed uh, last year's enrollment, which is fantastic. I mean, that's an incredible uh, blessing and, and a miracle. Uh, but we, we really need to be around 300 in order to do what we're doing and because every student matters. And I think that's more than possible. And we were so grateful. Uh, this might sound like a shock these days, but Fox 31 and KWGN offered us really through the summer some amazing times uh, to promote our Christian school and our center of hope. Uh, sent over three amazing people, and we're just very, very grateful. Um, it's not free, but it is uh, at a discounted rate for us. I mean, for all the spots that will play throughout the day and during some of their key shows and some of the key viewing times, uh, we got it for $20,000 for the whole summer. That's amazing. Uh, but, you know, 20 cents right now is, uh, is a big step for us. We have, a, we have a bunch on our plate with this renovation that's, you know, continuing to climb just because when you dig into something that's been there and hasn't really been touched for 29 years, any of you who know construction know that you don't just tear up the carpet, you end up going, oh, the subfloor is bad. Oh, you know what's bad below that? And all of it costs money. And so that's where we're at. So I just want you to pray. And uh, I had some that were mentioning last night, they might like to cover the advertisement. We'd love for that to happen. But at the end of the day, we're doing it because we want people to know that we have an alternative and it's a great private Christian school. We have some amazing teachers that are continuing to join our team. Uh, and we'll be introducing them to you as we get closer to the school year. We have a full day conference on May 26th to really pre- prepare every teacher and our staff for the culture of the school that will be based on the purposes of God, the clear gospel of grace, and really be a, ch- a, a school where love uh, is uh, embodied in all that we do. So here we are in this journey. Uh, in the book of James. And I hope you're taking my challenge to read through about six verses a day. That's all. I mean, literally, it it ends up being about six verses a week if you just want to read through it once. But just a couple verses a day, and you'll be able to get through this book a couple of times this summer. And that's what's important, is that we all are looking to the Word and understanding that, man, if I'm not teaching God's Word appropriately or accurately, not according to your opinion— but theologically and doctrinally, then you need to know that. You know, you need to be aware of it. Uh, I hope you're enjoying the the wonderful weather. I had a chance to go to my uh, youngest grandson's baseball game yesterday. He's uh, he's playing baseball. His dad's coaching. Chad's such a great coach and got to watch Calvin. Uh, and it was so beautiful yesterday, wasn't it? It was like an hour of reprieve, and I, I loved it. And, you know, you don't really keep track when kids are that small. They're just out there to have fun. But he did go three for three from the plate. So that was, uh, <laughs> was important to Grandpa. But uh, just super proud of him. A lot of fun. I hope you're enjoying the weather. And, uh, you know, I want to also let you know, on the weekends, my goal 
for being in the foyer is to greet as many of you as possible, just to let you know I love you. As your pastor, I'm humbled to be your pastor, and I, I want to do that. I wish I could stop and have long conversations and pray for every prayer. So what we do is we bring our pastor on call. You saw Pastor Jacob. He'll be out there with me. We also bring one of our pastors on the care team, which this week is Pastor Scott Dozer. So we've got you surrounded. And sometimes people need what we offer through the week, support classes, marriage counseling. You know, sometimes it's a reach department that they need to be connected with. So I will make sure that if you come out, we, we get a chance to greet you, that your needs will be taken care of and we'll get you in touch with the appropriate staff member to help you, okay? I just want you to know that it feels always funny for me when I'm like, oh, you know what? I, I really want to keep greeting people and then I feel like I'm hurting somebody's feelings. I just want to let all of you know up front, we've got you covered. We will make sure that you are cared for, right? Now, as we move into chapter one, we're getting now into the middle section of chapter one. Last week we went through verse six. Now you'll see that some weeks I'll go back. We'll start this week with two of the verses that we read last week. And, uh, you know, I, I want to just share this with you. I've been a pastor going on 38, a little over 38 years. As long as I've been married, I've been a pastor in ministry. I uh, got ordained in the very school and college that I grew up in. Uh, the college was connected to the high school and the, sta the ministry and the youth ministry and, and did youth ministry there, actually led some worship there before that place closed down. And then I moved over to Community Baptist, which is now Center Point, which is changing to Harbor Church. And in all those years of growing as a pastor, I think some people assume, well, gosh, it's just been easy for you, right? You just got into ministry and that's all you've done. Uh, that couldn't be further from the truth. The first about 17 years of ministry, I worked every odd job you could possibly work so that I could do ministry and try and be a good husband and father. I mean, I cleaned toilets for lean infection control. I did janitorial work. I, I roofed houses. I sold appliances. I even owned an appliance center for a while. I sold real estate. I did everything because it was all a means to the end. And I'll never forget one of those moments in my life. I was on John Putstock's dad's roof, and I fell 22 feet onto the concrete driveway. And my wife said, what saved me is I landed on my butt. Now, that's just, that's a personal pro problem with my wife's, uh, you know, making fun of that. But anyways, I, I landed and I, I didn't think I broke anything. Maybe years later when I had back surgeries, maybe it started there. But I remember rolling over. I was stunned. I got to the grass. The guy that was roofing with me was coming down the, the you know, ladder and he's afraid. It was his company. And I'm like, I'm good, Ken, I'm good. And I just remember laying there going, God, is this what it's going to be like forever? Uh, really, am I just going to keep falling off roofs and cleaning toilets? I mean, is there, is there ever going to be a point when I'm just going to be able to focus as a pastor? And, you know, I don't think God ever really intended that because I've never really just been a pastor. I have a lot of other responsibilities. But at the end of the day, you got to go through those challenges to strengthen your faith, to grow. And today I want to talk to you about where you're at and how to embrace the place God has you in. Now, if you have your Bible, I'm going to turn to uh, James 1 in the NIV, but it's there on your outline. It's going to be on the screen. Just listen close. We'll start in verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. The brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position, but the one who is rich should take pride in his low position, because he will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossoms falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Now, those are profound and powerful words, and they really lay out, in my opinion, an extraordinary plan 
for embracing the place God has you. And where is that place? Maybe you're married and you've been trying to have children and it's not happening. And you're like, God, is this what it's going to be? I have a desire to have a child, but, but, but I have to be childless. Maybe you're single and you want to be married. Maybe you're in a job and you've been there forever, it seems like, and you've wanted out for decades. Maybe you're not in a job and you wish you were. Maybe it's something different than that. How do you embrace the place God has you in? Because I want you to see this. Everybody look here a minute. He will not take you one step further than where you're at until you're content with where he has you. Now, I want you to notice that these eight verses lay this out. I'm going to give you the first of these seven principles. The first is this. Expect God to give me the wisdom I ask him for. Expect him. Last week, I talked to you about praying expectantly. You see it right there. This isn't rocket science. But I have to ask you the question, do you pray expectantly? Do you expect God to give you wisdom when you ask for it? Because that is the one guarantee in Scripture, that if I ask God for wisdom, he will give it. Now, it's not like, boom, you were dumb and now you're brilliant. It doesn't work that way, all right? He gives us wisdom by putting us in situations and saying, now, turn to my word. Listen to the teaching. Apply the principles. Look at James 1, 5 again. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Do you know when we usually ask God? After we had zero wisdom, made the wrong decision, and we're in trouble. Now, everything in the Christian life comes down to faith. Amen? The Bible says so. Will I believe God has the best interest of mine in his mind when it comes to me? You know, the Bible makes it clear that none of us, none of us have it all together. And to those of you who think being a Christian means you have it all together, then you just need to pay attention to this verse because you may be the most deceived of all. He says, those who lack wisdom. Do you know what the inference here is? All of us lack wisdom. All of us. You know, what are you asking God for these days? Are you asking him for the right person to marry? Are you asking him for the right friendships? Are you asking him for the right job? Now, listen, I don't believe that there's just one job or one person or one friend group. But when you pray, God places those people in front of you. He gives you the wisdom to recognize who is best and who is not. Remember, the wisdom is this. Wisdom is the understanding of how to put into practice the knowledge you have gained. Did you catch that? Wisdom is the understanding of how to put into practice the knowledge you've gained. Listen, you need knowledge. When I talk about knowledge is not the end all, that's because so many Christians think that knowing God's word is what makes them mature. It does not. Knowing God's word does not make you mature. Doing what you know makes you mature. But you still have to know it, gnosis. You know, you have to know God. You have to study his word. God asks us to attempt the improbable so that he can do the impossible. That's what God asks from us. He says, I want you to attempt the improbable. Guys, look back at what we just did in the last seven months or so. We did the improbable and God has done the impossible, and he's still got a long ways to go. There's a lot of impossibility ahead of us right now. You know, I go back to something I shared with you guys, but I'm not sure if it, it, it registered. I was signing contracts with general contractors before we even closed on the building. Signing millions of dollars of contracts before we'd even raised the millions of dollars to buy it. Now, the reason is simple. It was either we start the school and we start our center of hope or we don't do this because there's no way to survive if we don't. Now, I want you to think about the most amazing stuff you've seen in the Bible. Do you think it was easy for Joshua and the, and the army of Israel to march around those fortified walls of Jericho blowing horns and banging cymbals while they mocked them? 
No, it wasn't. But do you think on that seventh day when the walls fell out so that they could go in and take over and you know, destroy every enemy of God, that it was a great day? It was. Do you think it was easy for David, who was fighting a giant five feet taller than him? I'm assuming. Do you think it was easy? Do you think it was easy for Joshua and the priests to step into the Jordan River at flood stage, believing that God would dry it up and dry the ground, and he did? You think it was easy for Abraham to take his only son that he had waited 90 years for and march him up Mount Moriah thinking he had to sacrifice his son? No. But they did it because they trusted God. You know, when we pray, do we believe that he's going to do what's best? So expect God to give me wisdom when I ask him for it. Second, we embrace the place God has us in when we make every request of God based on his perfect character. We make our requests based on his character. The reason so many prayers fall what seems like on deaf ears, the reason that happens is because we're praying selfish prayers. We're not praying purpose-driven prayers. We're not praying prayers that are based on God's character, his purpose, his plan, his desire. That doesn't mean you can't pray for things that are important to you. That's not what I'm saying. It's not what the Bible's saying. But it does say, what are your motives? You know, when's the last time you prayed for someone else? When's the last time you prayed for your enemy? When's the last time you prayed for that neighbor that drives you crazy? Maybe that's one and the same, right? You know, when you ask God to do something, make sure it is aligned with his perfect character. And if it isn't, then don't pray it. If it is, then don't doubt. Don't doubt. I love the way the Passion Translation puts verse 6. Look at it. Just make sure you ask empowered by confident faith. Circle that. And then he puts, without doubting, that you will receive. For the ambivalent person believes one minute and doubts the next. That's the ambivalent person. And he says this, being undecided makes you become like the rough seas, driven and tossed by the wind. You're up one minute and you're tossed down the next. Now, understand this. This is a verse about Christians and their struggle with being optimistic and pessimistic. It's bouncing in and out of negativity. I, I, I don't claim to be a, you know, a seafaring expert. I've only been on the ocean about six or seven times fishing for barracuda and yellowtail. And I remember the last time we went out of Dana Point, my wife agreed to go, which I wish she hadn't, but I talked her into it. She's been sick on a cruise ship. So when you're on a ship that hold, or a boat that holds 40 different fishermen, and you know the smell of those boats, not great, especially if you don't love fishing. And I remember my poor wife is in the cabin. They're making hamburgers while the boat is being tossed back and forth by a small storm. Now, we're all fishing, having a good time. I remember I went around the corner. My wife's got a trash can, and it was just not a good sight. Listen, that's what life feels like when you're a Christian who bounces in and out of you try to control it? No, maybe I'll let God control it. When you bounce in and out of negativity and optimism. You know, that, that's what it feels like when your faith is unstable. You know what that feels like, don't you? Our, our faith feels this way because we no longer base our prayers on God's perfect track record. Now, you know what the Greek word is for doubt there? The Greek word is the word diakrine. Minios, and it literally means this, to be vacillating, to be vacillating. You know what the word's used for? In many different places in Scripture, it's the same word used for a staggering drunk. Now, this doesn't mean that we're not going to have doubts in our life, okay? But let's remember something. Feelings are not facts. It's, I, I remember that from the cartoon Nemo, where Bruce the shark says, Fish are not food, they're friends. I just remember it this way. Feelings are not facts, they're usually false. Now, I've been living in this passage for quite some time. Because of everything that's happening and all the challenges and us going into summer, it has put me in a place where I've had a little bit of stress again. And I'm like, okay, Lord, <clears throat> I'm going to trust you. 
and not doubt. And then about five minutes later, I have to pray that same prayer. And then about an hour later, I'm going to pray that same prayer. And I'm not good about talking to people about what I'm struggling with, so I'm just talking to God about it. And I think this, when we cling to the character of God, we don't focus on our circumstances or situations. We focus on him. And we don't listen to the negative influences. We simply take our fears and put them before our faithful, perfect, loving God. Now, how hard is that? Considering he has a perfect track record. Now, let me just give you this real quick. God's character guarantees a couple of things that you need to know. First, that nothing is impossible with God. Nothing. There is nothing that you are facing that is too much for God. He didn't go, whoa, I didn't see that one coming. Whoa, you got yourself in a problem I can't get you out of. He didn't do that. Now, if you believe that with God nothing is impossible, then you take risks for his kingdom. When you're convinced God wants you to do something, then you don't hesitate. God, I'm in a really secure job. I mean, I got great benefits. My family's at the you know, prime of their life. They're in you know, school. We've got all these bills. But I know you've called me to start a business. You better start that business. You know, don't take risks. You know those dumb risks? I used to say those stupid things when I did all kinds of risky stuff like, hey, I'm going to die when God wants me dead. He'll just kill me. <clears throat> no, that's not the risks I'm talking about. I'm talking about believing that God can do anything. So you step out in faith and you attempt it. Look at Matthew 19, 26. When Jesus is talking to the disciples and he's talking about salvation, he says this and he looks at them. And I love the scripture. It says, intently and said humanly speaking it is impossible but with god everything is possible amen everything is possible he was making it perfectly clear that our salvation is an act of faith and it's a gift of god nothing absolutely nothing is impossible with god and you know what else nothing he allows into our lives is for the purpose of harming us <clears throat> i i always Take a step back when I hear a Christian, and I know they're just hurting. I've been there too. But they say this, why did God do this to me? Why did God take my child? Why did God allow my husband to walk out on the family? Why? Guys, listen to me. Everybody look here. God did not do anything to harm you. The world will harm you. The enemy, Satan, will still kill and destroy you. But God is the only thing keeping you alive. He's the only person, the only being who is with you. God is not out to get us, Christian. He's already got us. He only wants to love us and make us more like his son. Now that can be difficult troubles and trials, but oftentimes we bring them on ourselves. He's not doing anything to hurt you. Everything is for your personal growth. Last week we talked about the purpose for your problems. Let me ask you something. Did it change the way you responded to problems when you left here? Did it change the way you got in your car and had to wait in the parking lot to get out of here? Did it change the way you approached the person on the road that bothers you? Did it change the way you had to deal with the waitress or the waiter that was rude to you? Did it change the way you viewed your problems? If it didn't, then you're not trusting God's character. Look at Psalm 119, 71. My suffering was good for me. Now, David is saying in the longest psalm in the Bible, he is saying this, I brought all the trouble on myself. My suffering was good for me, though, because it taught me to pay attention to your decrees, your truth. Now, that longest psalm in the Bible, we see this powerful display of God's character and qualities. God's character guarantees that everything is going to work out for the best. You know, last week I prayed with a couple that's been here for a long time, 20, 24 years, Dave and Pam Lowe, faithful servants of Jesus Christ in this ministry, great friends. Love them dearly. As they came in to pray, Pam shared really the whole story. Dave had told me a few months ago that she had a heart attack. I, I, I couldn't even believe it. She's been a nurse, takes care of herself, an amazing lady, and she had a heart attack. Well, then over the weekend, last weekend during services when I was praying with her, she shared that the kind of heart attack she had, and here's how she decided to go to the doctor. She had pressure in her chest, 
and decided she'd go see the doctor. I thought, if I went to the doctor every time I had pressure in my chest, I'd be in the doctor's office all day, every day. But she was wise enough to go. And it would have killed her. They had to put her on medication because it was the side of the heart where the widow maker is. So thank God they found it, but that's not the biggest miracle. The biggest miracle is that while they were scanning her, they found a tumor on the lower lobe of her lung. It's cancerous, but it would have been undetectable had she not gone in. Now they're going to be able to remove it in surgery, and we're praying for her through that. She'll do great, but there's no need for radiation or chemo because of that. God allowed one problem, and a big one, to save her from a worse one. That's what he does. And he allows those situations to grow our faith so that we trust him. Third, you know what else happens? God says, if you want to embrace the place I have you, then become stable in your faith. Become stable. Stabilize your faith. I want to reiterate what I said last week. This is not about the power of positive thinking. The power of positive thinking means this. I'm the power I need to change, and you are not. Yeah, I, I really don't pay as much attention to social media anymore, kind of you know, prune that from my life. We utilize it for ministry and some other reasons, but every now and then, <clears throat> get a few moments, and I'll see people's stories. You can see a lot from people's stories, and I am truly troubled when Christians put things on their social media to say, I am the queen of my life. I am the commander of my destiny. No, you're not. First of all, you're a Christian. God is your commander. He's your king. This is not about the power of positive thinking. I don't believe for one minute the answer of, to life's problems lie inside of my will and psyche. The answer to life's problems rests solely in the character and person of God and who he is. And the ability to be positive comes from believing his word, trusting his character, and yielding to his Holy Spirit. Look at James 1, 7 and 8. When you are half-hearted and wavering, it leaves you unstable. Can you really expect to receive anything from the Lord when you're in that condition? I'm going to tell you the worst place to be as a Christian. You'd be better off, except you'd be going to hell, if you were lost, than to be a Christian who's unstable because you've got one foot firmly in the world's philosophy and you dip every now and then in the truth. You know, some translations say you're tossed back and forth by every wave. That literally, and I talked about doubt, is that Greek word for the unstable, staggering drunk. Now picture the drunkest person you've ever seen. I hope you're not picturing yourself, but picture the drunkest person you've ever seen. That's what it means to be unstable in all our ways. And then you look there, it says, expect. God wants us to expect with complete confidence he's in control. Now here's something amazing. My, my oldest son was a paramedic and firefighter for about 10 years with Adams County. And when he was just getting into the paramedic side, he was an EMT running calls. And one of the first calls he ran, a guy was so drunk that his pit bull or somebody's pit bull chewed off his pointer finger and he didn't feel it. Jordan said, when we treated him, we didn't even use anesthetic. That's how drunk he was. And we look at that and say, gosh, that's really sad. Well, trust me, he felt it the next day. And so often we go through life that unstable as Christians, we're double-minded. We don't trust God. We don't ask him with confident faith. And we stagger through life like a stumbling, bumbling fool. And social media has created that uh, Christian journey that we just bounce in and out of all different philosophies and preaching and teaching and podcasts. And we, we dip a little here, a little there, and we never go to the source of truth, God's word. You know, there, there's really no joy in a person's life, Christian, when you're bouncing back and forth, casually dating the bride of Christ. I go to this church and go to that church. And I worship over in this church. Man, get committed. Get connected. Pour in and let it pour into you. Church is not a spectator sport. It is about participation. 
We are the body of Christ. Now, let me give you the key to rock solid faith, because if we talk about staggering, I don't give you the key, that's a problem. Look at Psalm 18 too. The Lord is my rock, my fortress and my savior. My God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me and my place of safety. Uh, you know, 35, or I mean, excuse me, 40 years ago, went to high school. A lot of us in here went to school. One of my very good friends was Scott Derrickson. He's a movie director, Hollywood now. Back in the day, he and I used to sing, and we took voice lessons from the same uh, music teacher, Mr. Paul Tan. And Scott's time for singing his song with Mr. Tan to prepare for a state, uh, you know, competition was right during my algebra class. I hated algebra. And Scott would stand in there and he would sing at the top of his lungs these words, the Lord is my rock, the Lord is my light. And he'd sing it, I could imitate him, but I won't. And, uh, And I could hear him. And I was thinking the whole time, oh God, if you're my rock, get me through algebra. Literally, I mean, it was a comfort to me. And it comes from that passage. Now, how do we have rock solid faith? Well, surprise, surprise, I'm gonna give you an acrostic to remember it. There's four ways. First, Read God's word. If you're not in God's word, you're not going to ever be stable, Christian. It's not enough just to hear it on the weekends. Joshua 1.8 says, read the word of God, meditate on it day and night, and be sure to do everything that's written in it. Then your way may be prosperous and you'll have great success. Then second, obey it. Obey God's will. I read it and then I obey it. Romans 12.2 We know what it says, I beg you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, and this is your reasonable act of service, and be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of my mind. Then, choose God's path. Every day, you have a choice. You can choose to take the right path. You know what the path is with God? Jeremiah 29, 11. I Call to me and I will show you great and mighty things and I will do what's best for you. And then finally, know God's purposes. Do you know why you're on this planet? Proverbs 16, 4 says, the Lord has made everything for his own purpose. Don't ever come to a place like, hey, yeah, I know those. Are you living them? You know how we remember this as a church? We have the purposes in our name, grace. We are here to glorify God. That is worship. We're here to relate to everyone. That is fellowship. We're here to act like Jesus. That is discipleship. We're here to care for others. That is ministry. And we're here to express God's love by explaining the good news. That is our mission. Those are the five reasons you exist. You know, the first eight years of this ministry, I'm just going to tell you, we were like a staggering drunk. We were so unstable. Part of our problem was we had a lack of clarity. I was the only lead pastor. We had somebody else preaching the majority of the time. And it was always evangelism, 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 evangelism. Well, that's really important because it's the only purpose you can just do here on earth. There's no need for evangelism in heaven. However, that's only one purpose. And the other four purposes were not being touched except behind the scenes. You gotta be stable, and the way to be stable is to have all five purposes at balance in your life. How else do we embrace the place God has us? Write this down. Rejoice over all God has and has not given me. You're like, hey, I get rejoicing over what he's given me, but what he hasn't given me? That's right. James goes on to talk about this, and he makes it very clear. Everywhere in Scripture we see this. I own nothing, Christian. You own nothing. Everything I have. Everything in my bank account, everything in my life, everything in my home, everything I have belongs to God. I am a manager. I'm just a steward. You know, as we have all stepped out and we've made these sacrifices, you know, every now and then we'll get this attitude, well, I gave my money and I did this. No, you didn't. You were a conduit of God's resources. That's what we are. And he says this to the wealthy. And you're like, oh, God, that's not for me. I'm not rich. Oh, are you an American? You're richer than the majority of the world. He says this, the brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position. In other words, if you're humble and you don't have much, take pride in that. 
He says this, the believer who is poor still has reason to boast, for he has been placed on high. Now, taking great pride in being humble sounds a little bit of an oxymoron, but it's basically saying, God, I am thankful that I am trusting you. You know, you're truly wealthy because you're a child of God. And I want to say something. There's nothing wrong with wealth. God, this is not a passage against being wealthy. Thank God for wealthy people who know how to make money, who know how to multiply money, who are generous with their money. I mean, there are a lot of those people in this ministry. Thank God for that. But it's not about making money. It's about being a conduit of God's resources. It's about being that reservoir that has an outlet. And as the outlet is flowing health in a healthy way, the inlet will continue. You know, when we're able to give thanks with complete contentment overall, everything we have, everywhere we go, then we're truly maturing. And the evidence of true wisdom is when your social and economic position has no bearing on your eternal perspective. That's true maturity. Now, too many Christians go through life, and what are they doing? They're rebelling against who they are. Think about this. I want you to look here, because there is a massive, and it is a planned attack by the enemy, Satan, on who we are in this society. We're rebelling against our sex, our age, our height, even our self in general. Girls with a flair for sports want to be boys. You know, boys who are sensitive think, maybe I'm a girl. Young people wish they were older. You know, most people wish they were younger. Short, short people want to be taller. Tall people want to be inconspicuous. Some people even say, I wish I were dead. All of this is absurd. Listen, there is a illness in our society. We are a ministry that loves everyone. I don't care what you've done, what you're going through, what you're suffering from, what your gender is. I don't care about it. You are welcome in this ministry. If you want to look to the Word of God and discover who Jesus is, He will transform you from the inside out. You can be here. But we have a problem, guys. This transgender dysphoria is not just an issue in our country, it is an issue in the church. And we are losing young men and women to this as I speak in this ministry. And I'm not going to stand by and say nothing because it might hurt somebody's woke feelings. I don't care about that. What I do care about is this. You can love people where they're at. It is an illness. We don't celebrate an illness. We care for an illness. We love people through an illness. But we don't stand up and say, hey, guess what? You must be a boy if you have all those feelings. You know what? Boy can't go to the doctor in America and get help to grow his pecs and get his biceps bigger and get in better shape. A doctor would never do that. But if you want to cut something off and add some estrogen, we'll take care of you. And the same is true for a girl. What is wrong with that? If you don't think there's a problem, you're missing out. And don't ever say, that doesn't have anything to do with me. They can just do what they want. And listen, my friend, it has a lot to do with you. It is epidemic, and especially among girls. How do we stand in a loving way and in a firm way? We follow God's word. He wants us to be stable. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but you need to celebrate who he made you. I don't love the gap in my teeth. My parents couldn't afford the dentist. First time I went to the dentist, I was 23 and married. He goes, you have two cavities. When's the last time you were at the dentist? I go, uh, never. He's like, oh, good job. <laughs> Listen, I don't necessarily love a lot of things about myself, but I love who God made me. And I've accepted who he's made me. And think about this. There, there's another passage that Paul deals with this very subject as well. And, and it goes back to when he was in prison, in, and, and he writes to the Philippian believers. And he tells them, I have learned to be content with where I'm at. Now, 2,000 years ago, when you were thrown into a prison in Rome, <clears throat> you were in that prison, and you did not eat unless your family brought you food or your friends. So think about what he's facing. It wasn't Club Med. Look at this in Philippians 4.10. My heart overflows with joy. When I think of how you demonstrated love for me by your financial support for my ministry, for even though you have so little, you still continue to help me at every opportunity. I'm not telling you this because I'm in need. 
For I have learned to be satisfied. Circle that. I have learned to be satisfied and underline in every circumstance, in any circumstance. I know what it means to lack and I know what it means to experience overwhelming abundance. For I'm trained in the secret of overcoming all things, whether in fullness or in hunger. And I find that the strength of Christ's explosive power infuses me to conquer every difficulty in life. Every difficulty. How could Paul be satisfied in that situation? The answer is very simple. Because he gave thanks to God for all that he had and thanks to God for all that he didn't have. You know, I'm grateful for all that God has blessed me with, but I'm also grateful for the things he hasn't given me. He knew that I couldn't handle it, and that's how he works in our lives. Write this fifth way down. We gotta get through this real quick. Admit that everything I have belongs to God. Admit that everything I have belongs to God. If you're gonna embrace the place God has you in, you gotta admit that everything you have belongs to him. It's all his. Now this goes hand in hand with the last point, And I'll just expound on it a little bit. Look at James 1.10. But those who are rich boast in how God has brought them low and humbled them. For all their earthly glory will one day fade away like a wildflower in the meadow. There were many rich Jews that became believers in Jesus Christ. And when they did, they lost everything. And they were persecuted greatly. And he said, rejoice in that. You know why? Because at the end of the day, they went, I don't need that money. I don't need this wealth. I just need God. You know, I've read more than my fair share of people who went from riches to rags story, right? We've read the rags to riches stories. Well, they've went from riches to rags and said it was the best thing that happened to me. Now, it just depends on the individual. David, as he's getting near the end of his life, King David, sees a problem in Israel. There's great wealth. And he's like, you guys are looking at this all wrong. And so as his dying breath, he was only 75 years old. And he made a lot of mistakes as a 75-year-old man. But in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, he says this, Now our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you. And we have given you only what comes from your hand. What an amazing verse. This is the attitude that should rule in the heart and life of every believer. The only way to truly embrace where God has us is to stop looking at where you think you want to be. It doesn't mean you can't have dreams or goals or aspirations, but have you stopped for a moment and thank God for where he has you? Brings us to the sixth way to embrace this in this passage. Cling to the stuff of heaven, not the things of earth. Cling to the stuff of heaven. Now, That sounds hyper-spiritual, I I understand. But that's what the passage says. We are among the most prosperous people on earth as Christian Americans. We have more in our trash can right now than many people have in a whole month. If you think this country is terrible, you should travel abroad. You should go to some of the places I've gone where people don't know where their next meal is coming from. Did you know this statistic? It still reigns true today. If you have a roof of any kind over your head, if you have $10 in your bank account and you have food for three days, you are wealthier than 92% of the world's population. Now look at James 1.11. I love this message paraphrase. You know that as soon as the sun rises, pouring down its scorching heat, the flower withers, its petals wilt, and before you know it, that beautiful face is barren, is a barren stem. Well, that's a picture of the prosperous life. At the very moment everyone is looking on in admiration, it just fades away to nothing. Again, this is not a message against being wealthy, but God wants our focus firmly on him and on his purposes. You know, the stuff of heaven really boils down to two things. You know there's only two things that are going to last forever? Only two. God's word and people. God's word, God's people. Now, people that are not God's uh, people that have rejected the gospel are going to live forever too. They're just going to live forever separated from God in hell. But the only two things that are going to last forever are God's word and, and people. So why are we investing in anything else? There's nothing more to invest in. Let me just tell you a quick story. In 1990, uh, my wife, myself, a guy named David, we had a band, and we were invited because I'd written a song um, to a concert 
in Wichita, Kansas, where Rich Mullins, some of you may remember, wrote Awesome God and many, many, many other songs. It was the headline. And so they said, we'd like you to come. I'd written a song, and this was a hope for the heartland. It was about, you know, the unborn child. And they said, we'd like you to sing this song and do a little concert. So we went, traveled out there, had no idea what we were doing. We get there, we stay with the host family, great family. And then that, that day in August, you know, August in Wichita, a little hot, they had a couple uh, uh, motor homes, and one of them was for us. We get in, it's all air conditioned, and we're sitting in there eating fruit, feeling like kings. We'd never been treated that way. They said, hey, listen, there's going to be ten to 12,000 people here tonight. We're like, what? I mean, I think the biggest crowd we played for was 500 maybe. And so we're, we're a little nervous, you know, and all of a sudden there's a knock at the door, and I open it up, and Rich Mullins is standing there. He's in cut-off sweats, barefoot, cut-off T-shirt. It's like, hey, how you doing? I'm Rich Mullins. I'm like, I know who you are. He came in and spent the afternoon with us. He sat in there. We talked. I mean, he shared his story. He said, you know what I want to do? I want to sell everything. When I turned 45, he was about eight years from that. And he said, I want to move to the Navajo Reservation and teach Navajo Indian children how to play instruments. He played 16 instruments. And he said, I just want to teach them how to worship God. I'm like, you're even better in person than I imagined, right? So that night, we are the final of like 12 acts. We're the final act before Rich. We do our concert. It was an incredible experience. And then we walked off stage and stood right at the front of the stage so we could just be fans and listen to Rich. Well, right before we went on to perform, the stage manager comes up and he goes, listen, you're going to have to cut two songs. We're behind. Rich goes, they're not cutting anything. He's like, well, dude, your concert is going to be later, and they came to see you. And I'm like, yeah, they came to see you. He's like, no, don't cut anything. When we got back down in front of the stage, one of the coolest things happened. He got to the end of the concert. It was an amazing concert. And he said, hey, Rick, can you and Shelly come back up? Go back up on the stage. He sits down at the piano. Everybody's been waiting for awesome God. He hands the microphone to me. (laughs) Sing it. I'll play the piano. Like, you got to be kidding me. (laughs) So I did. It was a great night. People worshiped. It was amazing. When I left... A couple years later, he wrote a song, Stuff of Heaven, Things of Earth. I said to Shell, that is the most heavenly-minded person I've ever met. Three years later, he died in an accident. Driving down the highway, his friend rolled a Jeep and killed him. You know, Rich never got to live that dream, but he lived a dream that demonstrated to me how to live my life for the things of heaven. Let me bring you this last one. Expect true happiness after tough circumstances. Expect true happiness after tough circumstances. This is how James wraps up this section. And he says it in this powerful way in verse 12. Look here. If your faith remains strong, even while surrounded by life's difficulties, you will continue to experience the untold blessings of God. True happiness comes as you pass the test with faith. And receive the victorious crown of life promised to every lover of God. Now, I want to tell you something. This is a deeply theological passage. And this is a very deep verse. I don't want to lose you on it. Not because you're not intelligent. Because it's heavy. But let me just give it to you real quick. In concluding his discussion on holy trials, James pronounces a blessing on the person who stands up after afflictions. The Christian. And when a person like this, has stood the test or has been approved by God, you're going to receive the crown of life. Now, understand this. You receive salvation once by faith when you're born again. You are saved. That's a done deal. So what is this crown of life? I had this discussion last night with a family member about, well, what is this? And I said, well, in the millennial reign of Christ, we will have responsibilities, and those responsibilities will be dependent on what we did with our salvation as Christians. Some people may be praying silently in their prayer closet, giving financially. You may never see them on a stage, and they're going to be a mayor of a city, and someone who's maybe been like me that didn't have the right heart is going to be the janitor. God has an economy in his kingdom, and he says, listen, there are two judgments coming. The first is the great white throne judgment. And the Bible says the great white throne judgment is only for those who reject the gospel. So everyone 
who rejects salvation will stand before the great white throne judgment. No Christian, all unbelievers. I just finished reading through the book of Revelation with my family. We just read a passage a day. We text it to each other, our thoughts, and that's just what we do. And so we started Matthew today. But I want to read this in Revelation 20, near the end of the book, two chapters away. It says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. And I saw the dead, small and great, under, uh, great, standing before God, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. When they were judged, each one according to his works... Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Does that not put shivers down your spine for the people that don't know Jesus? Why should we be sharing the gospel? We don't want anyone there. But there's also a second judgment. This judgment happens right after the rapture of the church. It's the judgment seat of Christ, and it's only for those who are Christians. Only for those who at one point in their life said, God, I understand you're perfect, and I am not. I am sinful. And God, I admit that. I repent. I changed my mind about what I believed, and I believe that your son Jesus came into the world, lived a perfect life, died a dreadful death on the cross, and paid for all of my sins. I believe he rose again, and I trust in him alone to save me. In that moment, you are born again. Now, Everything you do from that moment matters, not for your salvation, but for the judgment seat. Look at this in 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Now, this has nothing to do with uh, salvation, but it is often referred to as the bema seat. It's not bema, it's bema, epsilon in the Greek, bema seat. And it's often identified as a platform, maybe where Pontius Pilate was raised up judging Jesus. That is not what it is. As a matter of fact, what Paul had in mind in this context were the athletic games in the Greek isthmus. And Paul envisioned Christians as competitors in a spiritual contest. We don't compete against each other, compete against the enemies and forces of this world. And we will receive that reward, heavenly treasures, the words, well done, my good and faithful servant, will not be spoken to every Christian. It depends on what we've done for his purposes and his glory. And listen, it doesn't matter what you do as much as it matters why you do it. Once we gain an eternal perspective, then what we see is this. Jesus has called us to serve God's purposes. And I want you to make, make this very clear. There is an economy in the kingdom of God. Now, heaven's going to be heaven. And it's going to be remarkable for all of us. But in his kingdom, there are going to be responsibilities, Christian. What are you doing? Are you embracing the place God has you in? Are you content with where he has you? Because he won't take you another step until you are. And some say, well, we have to do things to get to heaven. No, we don't. God did it all through Jesus. Look at John 6, 29. Jesus told them, this is the will of God, that you believe in the one he has sent. Let me have you bow your heads and close your eyes for a minute. So the question is this. Have you come to the place where you believe in the one he has sent? If you've never done that, and I mean for salvation, not, yeah, yeah, I believe there's Jesus, and yeah, I believe he died. No, no, no you've trusted in him alone, then do it now. You can literally talk to God silently in your mind. You could say something like this, God, I get it. You're perfect and holy and I am not. And right now, I confess that. And I admit, Father, there is nothing I can do to save myself. But I believe that Jesus Christ, your perfect son, came into this world, lived a sinless life, and died on a cross 2,000 years ago. And I believe he rose again. And right now, I trust in him alone to save me. Thank you, God. Friend, welcome to the family of God. 
You've been born again. I want to pray for you. I'm not going to have you stand up or come forward in a moment. I'll have you slip up your hand and put it right back down. It just tells me you got it. So if you're saying today, I believe and I receive the free gift of salvation, would you just slip your hand up? Just slip it up and put it right back down. God bless you guys. God bless you. Praise God. God bless you. You know, we have some gifts for you. As you leave, after we sing this song, you can stop by the Connection Center right outside the door. Just say, I'd like a new believer bag. It's a new Bible. My, my daily devotional, Grace Happens. Uh, a couple other gifts. Just stop by and get it. Or you can text the word BELIEVE to 720-895-9000, which is the church number. Follow the prompts and we'll get it to you this week. Welcome to the family of God. Father, thank you for your amazing word. <clears throat> Lord, may we embrace the place you have us in. May we be content with where you have us so that we can be discontent at seeing people die without you. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we worship you now in Jesus' name. Amen.